they didn't understand how much work like owning a business is or running a business is. This is not rocket science, right? As a, as a philosophical point, but it's like owning, owning a business isn't just a matter of like having money and then checking in on it every once in a while to see how much it's grown. It's a job. It's, and it's more of a job than a nine to five, most nine to five jobs, right? It's a 24 hour a day job that requires an incredible amount of attention and effort and skill and good luck. Uh, but just this combination of things that most philosophers just seem to have no real clue about. Welcome everyone to the Liberty Ventures podcast. My name is Alexander McCobin, one of the founders and general partner at Liberty Ventures, and just thrilled to keep building up this ecosystem of purpose-driven investors and entrepreneurs aligned on advancing a free and prosperous future. And today we've got a, someone with a little bit of a different background, but someone who has a lot to say about business and business ethics that applies to everything we're doing with the ecosystem. Dr. Matt Walensky is a longtime friend and a professor of philosophy at the University of San Diego. He's the author of numerous books and articles on the philosophy of politics, philosophy, and economics. And in 2011, started the Bleeding Heart Libertarians blog, which for 10 years explored the compatibility of free markets and social justice, in addition to all of his writings with other great individuals like, like Dr. Tomasi on the individualist radicals, reactionaries, and the struggle for the soul of libertarianism, the intellectual history of libertarianism, and lots on business ethics itself. So Matt, it's great to have you here. Thanks for joining us. I'm absolutely happy to do it. So. I always like to start by just providing context for everyone listening with your story, what's led to who you are and what you're doing today before we start diving into applying it to this community. And I'd love for you to just take a couple of minutes and share that with us, if you will. Yeah, happy to do so. Um, so uh, I'm a philosophy professor, uh, which if you asked me when I was 15 years old, what I wanted to be when I grew up, uh, that wouldn't have been on my list because I didn't actually know it was a thing one could do. Uh, I thought philosophers were things you had like back in ancient Athens, but that like that wasn't simply a job that existed anymore. <laughs> I kind of stumbled into philosophy by accident uh, when I was an undergraduate at Santa Clara University, which is a uh, Jesuit University, good old Jesuit University that still requires people to take philosophy classes as a prerequisite for graduating. And um, I took the course, I fell in love with the topic, and I thought, wow, this is, this is exciting. These are big, important questions. Uh, I had previously been planning to go to law school uh, and work as a lawyer, because I don't know, that's what CP a lot of people I knew seemed to do after college graduation. Um, then I worked with a lawyer for a summer and that pretty much killed that <laughs> aspiration fairly quickly. But philosophy, I really loved. It, it seemed important. Uh, it was asking questions that mattered about the meaning of life, about the purpose of government, about um, how we ought to relate to each other as human beings. These are deeply important, practical even, questions. And uh, questions that I thought that maybe I could have something to say about, but I certainly wanted to spend more time thinking about. Uh, and so I ditched the law school plans, uh, applied to graduate school, got very, very lucky to wind up in a in a good program with some people who um, knew what they were doing and knew how to mentor me along into a position where I could actually do this for a living. So I graduated from the University of Arizona with my PhD in 2003, uh, got a job at the University of San Diego uh, right afterwards, and have been there ever since, um, teaching courses in business ethics, in theoretical ethics, in political philosophy, philosophy of law, and uh, most recently, a kind of interdisciplinary cluster called philosophy, politics, and economics. And uh, it's it's wonderful. I feel really blessed to have found myself in, in a situation where I can think about and write about and talk about ideas that matter for a living. Uh, and um, I'm just a tremendous amount of gratitude for, for all the people who helped me along the way. So. You approached it very differently than me. I was a philosophy graduate student, as you know, and I had the dream of potentially living out the life of a Greek philosopher or an Immanuel Kant or someone theorizing and realized academia wasn't like that anymore for me. So I have the utmost respect for you actually pursuing it when you realized what it was. And for this audience, you were mainly talking to investors and entrepreneurs. I want to dig into the business ethics side of your work a little bit. And so wondering if you could share a little bit of the kind of research that you've done there and how you approach business ethics. 
Yeah, so I, business ethics was one of the first areas of research that I got into um, once I got my PhD and, and started uh, publishing. And what drew me into the field was um, a couple of things. One was a sense that, uh, again, there were some really important questions here to be answered. Um, so I thought, you know, the, the role of business in society um, is, is <laughs> substantial and, uh, and, and can do tremendous harm or tremendous good. Uh, I think business has been a force for both uh, in, mm -hmm. in history. Uh, some of the, the greatest conveniences, the greatest uh, essentials of, of life today were created by entrepreneurs who had an idea and who had the acumen to turn that idea into a reality. Um, so on the one hand, there's that. But uh, on the other hand, you have a lot, of, a lot of fraud, a lot of deceit, a lot of shady dealers out there. Who 100%. are trying to make a quick buck um, <laughs> in any way they can, um, without regard for for the underlying principles or the or the long term commitment to customer or societal well being. So I thought like these there's some really important issues here, and the people who were writing about business ethics at the time, I thought weren't doing a terribly good job at understanding the field. So. Business ethics was a field dominated mostly by philosophers and dominated mostly by philosophers who really didn't understand how markets work. They mm -hmm. didn't understand capitalism. They didn't understand entrepreneurship. Um, they didn't understand the kind of dynamic risk taking that's involved in being in, in the world of business. Uh, and so I thought that lack of understanding was leading them to make some pronouncements about ethics that were really quite fundamentally misguided. Uh, and so what I wanted to do, because I did have a bit of an economics background, um, was to take, take some fairly uncontroversial uh, economic ideas, bring them into the world of business ethics, and see how that changed the game, how that changed the kind of conclusions that we reached about uh, what's ethical and what's not. So. When you say that they misunderstood economics, markets, entrepreneurship, and you wanted to bring just some basic uncontroversial principles into the field, what what were some of those principles or some of those misunderstandings that you wanted to correct? Well, so for instance, I mean, just I didn't I haven't written much about this particular issue, but um, a lot of philosophers who were teaching business ethics spent ninety percent of their course talking about ideas of distributive justice, right? Meaning. Um, who, who gets what, essentially, in society? Is it fair that the rich have this much money and the poor only have this much? Uh, is it fair that there's this much inequality between CEOs and workers? Um, and those are all fine questions to ask, but you got to understand how markets work in order to be able to address those questions intelligently, right? So a lot of philosophers seem to have this view that if you were a business owner, what that meant was you owned a bunch of wealth, and then kind of by magic, you were simply able to turn that wealth into more wealth. Whereas if you didn't have wealth, you were kind of out of luck and there was nothing you could do about it. Um, they didn't understand how much work like owning a business is or running a business is. <laughs> this is not rocket science, right, as a, as a philosophical point, but it's like owning, owning a business isn't just a matter of like having money and then checking in on it every once in a while to see how much has grown. It's a job. It's... And it's more of a job than a nine to five, most nine to five jobs, right? It's a 24 hour a day job it's that requires an incredible amount of attention and effort and skill and good luck. Uh, but just this combination of things that most philosophers just seem to have no real clue about. So I think, you know, once once you appreciate um, what goes into to business, um, yeah, you could still ask those questions about distributive justice, but this idea that capitalists are just kind of out there living off the backs of the proletariat starts to look a little less plausible, uh, I think. 100%. And I also find that oftentimes in philosophy, there's the sense that wealth, it just exists. It's a pile of gold that right. someone's sitting on. And so then we can talk about how we distribute this instead of understanding the working capital that's actually involved in how much people are worth, quote unquote, and how that's tied up in, in productive endeavors in order to maintain and create new value. That's right. I think, I think a lot of philosophers tend to take what I sometimes call a static 
view of these distributive questions, right? So philosophers are fond in thinking in terms of thought experiments, right? So they'll say, you know, imagine an island where Fred has 10 bananas and Barney has zero, right? Uh, you know, what would be the fair way for Fred to divide up his bananas? And you just, you look at this, this kind of moment in time, right? It's like where Fred has bananas and Barney doesn't, like no question there about how Fred got the bananas. Like why doesn't Barney have any, those are all kind of ruled out of the question. And then we just sort of test your intuitions about what a fair distribution of these things were. There's also no questions about what the larger ongoing effects of our distributive policies are in this scenarios, right? So, you know, imagine we say like, okay, Fred's got 10 bananas, Barney's got zero. That seems unfair. Let's give half of, half of Fred's bananas to Barney. Well, okay, now what happens tomorrow, right? When Fred's out there, you know, climbing up trees, <laughs> cutting off it. Like, how, how does this, this policy that we've just enacted aff affect Fred's future incentives to generate more bananas, right? And how does whatever we've done to Fred's incentives affect Barney? Not today, but tomorrow or three days from now or next week, right? That dynamic perspective about how institutions affect people's incentives and behaviors over time is very often completely ignored in the philosophical thought experiments that were driving so much of business ethics at the time. So these are great highlights of what was done wrong before. What, what were some of the conclusions that you drew as you started to do more research into business ethics and started to bring some of these principles into it? So like any academic, my, um, my research was relatively narrowly focused, right? So I kind of picked, picked one problem that I wanted to work on and then kind of ground away on it. Uh, and the problem that I landed on um, by kind of a weird chain of events um, was exploitation. Um, this idea that um, it, you know, sometimes in a market economy, uh, you have some people or some firms that are exploiting others. They're taking unfair advantage of some vulnerability in others. Um, so, for instance, you know, one of the first areas in which I explored this idea was the phenomenon of so-called sweatshop labor. Right? So you have large multinational enterprises that are outsourcing production. Uh, overseas, right? So you might have Nike, for instance, um, relying upon a, uh, a manufacturer in Indonesia to produce a lot of its goods, which are then shipped back to the United States and sold at very high prices. And a lot of people look at this and say like, okay, you've know, you got a pair of Nike shoes that are selling for like $150. The people who actually made those shoes are making 10 cents an hour, right? Like how... How can that be fair? How can that be just? Isn't Nike just taking advantage of those people? And shouldn't we do something about it? Maybe we should boycott Nike, right? Or um, maybe we should try to get some laws passed that'll uh, regulate what Nike can do. That struck me as interesting um, and important. Um, and and, you know, and, a, and a live issue at the time, I started writing about sweatshops probably around the year 2000. And at the time, this was a big issue on a lot of college campuses, mm -hmm. including the University of Arizona, where I went to school. Um, U of A had a contract with Nike to provide a lot of its athletic apparel. And news stories were coming out about the conditions in some of Nike's factories. And so you had students like staging sit-ins in the president's office demanding that they cut their ties with Nike over these abuses. So I thought, like, I want to I want to get in and think about this uh, a little bit more carefully, um, both about the kind of underlying moral issues and the uh, and the underlying economics of it as well. Um, and so what that led me to was a conclusion that, well, <laughs> typical academic conclusion, right? But uh, things are a lot more complicated than they look like at first, right? So <laughs> yeah, it's difficult they're... to talk about complicated issues in today's world, but that's <laughs> academia seems to be one place where you can dive into that still. Maybe a little bit too much. Uh, <laughs> academics are sort of in love with nuance for nuance's sake at sometimes, but uh, but the world is a complicated case place. It's rarely as black and white as as most people make it out to be, and that's true in a lot of places, uh, um, sweatshop labor included, right? So there are some some genuinely bad actors. Uh, in the world of international business, there are some people who really do abuse and exploit their workers. There are cases of, of sexual assault, of physical abuse, of um, uh, coercive imprisonment of laborers, essentially kidnapping, uh, all kinds of really horrible stuff um, that ought 
to have attention drawn to it and that ought to uh, spark a lot of public criticism and action uh, to the extent that that we can do something to correct those problems. Um, but in terms of the more basic issue of, you know, what well, is it unfair of workers to be paid so little for shoes that wind up selling for so much? Um, that struck me as much less clearly objectionable. Um, so it's true that compared to prevailing wage rates in the United States, uh, people in the developing world who work in these uh, factories are not earning very much at all. Uh, and so if you make that comparison, which, of course, is the natural comparison for people in the United States to make, uh, it looks really bad. But if you go one step further and you compare wage rates in Nike's uh, factories in Indonesia with wage rates elsewhere in Indonesia, uh, then the picture starts to change pretty dramatically. Uh, and what you see is that firms that are associated, that have a kind of subcontracting relationship with a multinational enterprise, uh, often actually pay substantially higher wages than wages elsewhere in the economy. Um, that the working conditions in these factories, while again, bad by American standards, are often much better than working conditions elsewhere in the domestic economy, which shouldn't really be surprising when you stop to think about it, because when these sweatshop jobs open up in these countries, people often line up around the block to apply for one of these jobs. Like, and why would they do that if there was a better option available to them, right? If sweatshops really were taking egregious advantage of these workers, and they could do better elsewhere, then like, why wouldn't they? The fact that workers are lining up for these jobs is an indication that those jobs are far superior to any available alternative that those workers have open to them. And that, in turn, should send a pretty strong cautionary note to any well-meaning activists who might want to intervene on sweatshop workers' behalf, mm. because if you think, well, like sweatshops are evil, we should get a law to get those things shut down, and you succeed, God help you, <laughs> what you've just succeeded in doing is taking away the least bad option that those workers have open to them. Uh, what you've done is you've taken people who are already in a pretty bad situation, and you've made that situation worse. Um, so we really, really need to be cautious, I think, um, even when we're trying to do good in the world, that we're not inadvertently going to produce a set of consequences that is very, very different and much less palatable than the consequences we intended. Fascinating insight and directly applicable to how activists and the general public should be thinking about this issue of exploitation. Let's talk about how this might apply to people who are investing in companies or entrepreneurs when they're thinking about how they set up their businesses. How, how might you recommend they think about the way that, the, that exploitation works within their companies, given all of that? I have a tremendous amount of respect for entrepreneurs who try to bring some kind of moral vision to their business. And I think a lot of entrepreneurs do that in one way or another, right? They're not they're not just in it to make a buck. They're in it because they think that what they're doing is making the world a better place in some significant way. Um, and very often they're right. Um, I think that's that's tremendously important. That's tremendously admirable. Entrepreneurs who are committed to providing a, uh, a fair and humane uh, employment place for their workers, you know, people who kept their workers on during COVID pandemic when they could have just as easily let them off. Like that's, that's a really ad morally admirable thing uh, for, for employers to do. The problems start to come in when your moral vision extends very far beyond the confines of your workplace, right? When it's not just about treating your workers well or treating your uh, customers well, but it's about um, achieving social justice in some broader and more nebulous sense. That, I think, is when problems can start to arise in the world of business ethics. Because the problem is the world's a really complicated place. Um, <laughs> and we very often, even, even really smart people, we very often have no clue 
what the broader social ramifications of what we're doing are going to be. Um, and so if we try to design our business in a way that's going to achieve racial harmony or achieve this or that uh, grand social vision, we're often going to find ourselves frustrated in the sense that we're not going to get the outcome that we wanted, um, or maybe even flummoxed in that we've pr produced an outcome that we positively didn't want. Um, the, the complicated nature of the social world, I think, is an obstacle to um, grand social engineering on a, on a very large scale. Uh, most of the time, most that all of us can do is look at our little corner of the world, <laughs> our family, our neighborhood, our customers, our employees, try to make their lives better in ways that we can sort of directly assess uh, and then hope that, you know, everybody else is doing the same thing in their corner of the world. But trying to go much beyond that um, is by and large a recipe for failure. What I think is really interesting about that is it's very in line with the recommendation for be, just being successful in business as an entrepreneur that's often given, that if you try to boil the ocean, you try to solve too many problems, you think you're going to do too, so many different things at once, you often do all of them very badly and you're not going to run a successful business. And I'm hearing something similar from you that if entrepreneurs or investors are trying to solve so many problems at once, moral problems through their businesses, and they're trying to have these grand impacts with what they're doing that may lead to them actually being less successful than if they were to narrow down on the kind of moral benefits they're trying to provide to other people. It can, yeah, I'm not, and I'm not saying it, it can never work. Um, it's, it's a note of caution, right? It's a note of, I think, humility um, that the world is a more complicated case, place than most of us appreciate, uh, and that it's often, hard to do good um, in a very grand sense, whereas it's often pretty easy to do evil <laughs> in a fairly grand sense. There's a kind of asymmetry there. Where it's, it's a lot easier to mess things up and break them than it is to fix them and set them right. I think that is a fantastic insight to, to share with the audience. And so I want to wrap up with just one more question for you, Matt. I always give the recommendation to people that if you want to get to know someone, if you want to get involved in a new type of business, or you just generally want to build a connection, the best thing to do is to offer to help, to offer to give some kind of value. So if anyone is interested in what you're working on and wants to carry this out or wants to learn more about philosophy or whatever it is that you're working on that you're interested in, and if they were to reach out to you and say, I want to volunteer to do X for you, what would you say, what would you actually respond to and say, that's interesting, let's talk? That's a great question. <laughs> yeah, because I'm a, I'm kind of a one man show. I sort of, uh, um, you know, I, I, I read a lot of books. I write a lot of things. I speak to a lot of people um, and I've sort of gotten used to doing all that myself. But boy, it sure would be nice to have some help every once in a while. Uh, I mean, I think, you know, the more the more people that are just kind of spreading the message about um about the way in which markets work, right? The way in which, you know, what what capitalism is, telling their story, right? If you're an entrepreneur and you have experience with the world of business, sharing that with people who don't have that kind of direct experience, just letting them know what it's like, right? Like, what are the challenges that you face? What are the opportunities that you encounter? You know, what are you proud of uh, as an entrepreneur? What, like, gets you out of bed in the morning and lets you, see, you know, look at yourself in the mirror and think like, I'm, I'm doing something important in this world. You know, sharing that kind of story with somebody who maybe doesn't have that kind of direct experience, it might not produce any kind of immediate result, but you've planted a seed in their brain so that when they, when they're thinking about business in the future, you know, when they're at the polling booth, when there's, you know, when their kid is in school and they're learning about, you know, the robber barons or something like that, they've got an idea on their, in their head that they can draw upon to maybe correct and provide a fuller, fuller story of, of what the world is like uh, in a way they wouldn't have otherwise. So I, my advice really is just share, share your story. Share, you know, we all live in our own little bubbles. We all have areas of experience that are near and dear to us. But for most of the world, most of human experience is a mystery to us. And so the only way we can cure or at least ameliorate this uh, ignorance that we all suffer from is to share our stories with each other. 
I love that. And I, I think that's a great recommendation for anyone listening. Share your stories so that other people are able to learn from it. Matt, thank you for all the research that you're doing for joining us today and just for being an amazing person. Thank my, you. My pleasure, Alexander. It was great to talk with you again. Same. Thank <laughs> you.